Good evening. Tributes have been paid across our islands to His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, following his death earlier today. The Channel Islands have always had a deep affection for the Queen and her husband, and visits were guaranteed the warmest of welcomes. Alison Moss has been looking back at the royal visits, which still burn bright in the memories of islanders. By his wife's side, steadfast in his support, and welcomed warmly by the crowds, his Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, has accompanied the Queen on their many visits to the Channel Islands. Their first in 1949, before the coronation. This fragment of the ancient Duchy of Normandy are vividly aware of the ties of fealty which bind us to the reigning monarch. The presence here of his daughter, the heiress presumptive to the throne, and of her husband is an event which we celebrate with universal rejoicing and will long remember. In 1957, they returned, this time Prince Philip as the Queen's consort, and repeated time after time, in total eight official occasions. But in the memories of so many are the most recent visits, the walkabouts, the excitement of school children as the royal helicopter arrives, new generations caught up in the fervour of flag-waving royal moments. Most recently, before the Duke of Edinburgh stepped back from public life, the royal couple returned to the islands for a final time to mark the 60th anniversary of liberation, a poignant occasion for those who lived through and remembered the occupation, the Second World War, the loss of life and the return of the Channel Islands to the Crown. Young people have been at the front of the crowds at all the royal tours of the Channel Islands. Their support of the Queen and Prince Philip has been clear to see. Away from the cameras, the support has been reciprocated by the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, which has impacted on the lives of thousands of young Channel Islanders. A legacy that lives on and won't be forgotten. Well, as news spread of the Duke's death, flags were lowered to half-mast on government buildings, offices and parish halls in Jersey. They'll remain at half-mast until after the royal funeral. Jersey's bailiff said Prince Philip exemplified duty and service. Here's Richard Hall. Government House in Jersey, a familiar venue for islanders and royal visitors alike. A suitable spot to remember a man who always made his mark. The Duke was always a very engaged man, a very inquiring man. He, of course, you know, had given valuable years over many decades of service, but he never lost that interest in wanting to know what and why and what you'd got to do with a particular thing. He was very, very interested in, in people as well as how things worked. The Duke flew for 44 years and flew 59 types of aircraft. It was quite an achievement for an admiral of the Navy. Well, I think like uh, many uh, people, he was a very, very keen aviator. He, of course, had spent many years flying with what was then the Queen's Flight, now 32, the Royal Squadron in the Royal Air Force, as, as part of his flying experience. And he very much enjoyed aviation. Uh, it was part of his character to want to be with technology, to be up there at the lead of things. So, yes, you know, not a bad record, but something that is typical of the man, I believe, who had a very great passion in modernising, in technology and in moving forward. But of course, his passion was the sea. And many here remember their first sight of the Royal Yacht Britannia before she retired from public duties, carrying the royal couple around the Bailiwick's island. He had an affection towards the island. We can tell that from history. I think that's right. Um, he, he came with um, the then Princess Elizabeth in 1949. Um, and he made, uh, in total, seven visits to the island, one of which he came on his own, dealing primarily with the Duke of Edinburgh's awards. He was an accessible facet of the monarchy. A great loss. Yes, I agree. 
The legacy he leaves behind is uh, should be an example to all of us, not least within the, within the island, things like the Duke of Edinburgh Reward Scheme, which has benefited and continues to benefit so many islanders. That really is the link with us and the islands that is so important, and, and that really makes this even more of a loss to us, doesn't it? Yes, and uh, it's, I mean, if you stand back from it, it's a loss, obviously, to us as islanders. It'll be a loss to the Queen and the royal family, to the country, and also the rest of the Commonwealth, uh, of such an important figure who spans so many decades of the history of the world and of Britain. He will be sorely missed. Meanwhile, Guernsey's Lieutenant Governor, Sir Ian Corder, who met Prince Philip several times during his service with the Royal Navy, described the Duke as a towering figure renowned for his sense of humour. Sir Ian joined Guernsey's bailiff and chief minister to pay tribute on behalf of the bailiwick. Ewan Duncan was there. Across the bailiwick today, a shared act of remembrance. This was an especially poignant day for those who had met the Duke. I was fortunate enough to meet him a couple of times during my service career as he visited various establishments that I, um, I was working in. Um, he was you know, a towering character. Um, I always thought he, you know, he was clearly immensely well informed, um, certainly about military matters and about sort of global affairs. Um, but he was also massively engaged with people, interested in people and um, and of course, he always had that sort of mischievous glint in his eye, which um, you know, I think many of us regard incredibly fondly. How will you remember Prince Philip? I think my overarching memory will be of somebody who epitomised commitment uh, and devotion to duty um, to uh, fulfil that role that he did as Her Majesty's Consort for nigh on 70 years. It takes huge um, devotion to, to your task and to your adopted country. Uh, and I think if, 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 above all else, that's the thing that stands out for me about his life. Guernsey's bailiff and chief minister reminded islanders of royal visits stretching back over the decades. Well, I think each of the visits that uh, Prince Philip and Her Majesty undertook, and there were six of them starting initially with something that we will all use at some stage in our lives, it seems, the Princess Elizabeth Hospital being opened back in 1949, uh, right through to that 60th anniversary of the, of the liberation, that he had a, an interest in the bailiwick. It was only on that last occasion, as I understand it, that they didn't visit the other islands of the bailiwick as well, so they always made time to take in the other islands. Uh, they had an interest in what was going on over here and we as loyal islanders reciprocated that interest by giving them our unswerving loyalty throughout. I only met him when he came to Guernsey and I, I don't mean I met him you know I was in the crowd when he was uh, when he was here I didn't actually wasn't ever introduced to him I just thought he was a great man because he had such character vitality energy intelligence uh, he was opinionated uh, you know even if whether you're a monarchist or not You've got to admire a man of that standing. How do you think the islands collectively will remember Prince Philip? I think with much affection, much admiration, uh, and with a smile, because he was a type of person that left a smile, you know, if he made the odd injudicious <laughs> comment, because he was a human being, it you just made you smile. You thought, uh, you know, he, he didn't have a bad bone in his body. He was a human being, and I think that's important. Further tributes continue to pour in, and a 41-gun salute will be held at Castle Cornet tomorrow from noon. In the most northerly Channel Island, there are fond memories of a royal visit back in 2001. Alderney and its neighbours pulled out all the stops to ensure the couple's short trip to their island was as special as they could make it. One member of that organising committee recalls Prince Philip's keen sense of humour. Prince Philip, when, I, uh, when he arrived and we welcomed him and, and I had a brief conversation with him and he asked whether everything had gone well and I said, I'm just so sorry that you're here for such a short time and he said, oh, you know, royal visits like fish, you know what they say. And I remember that saying, uh, you go off fish or fish goes off after if you have it too long. I can't remember what it was, but that was the thing and he just smiled and he, he always has witty remarks, hasn't he? He's just that sort of person. 
And in the past hour, Sark Senior has added his voice to the growing number of tributes. Christopher Beaumont said the Duke always took a keen interest in island life and understood Sark's special character. He would be greatly missed. His obvious delight at being here in Sark is memorable. He was sincerely interested in people and seemed to appreciate and value Sark's uniqueness. We remember his ready humour and the intelligence in his eyes. We have many photographs in the seigneury drawing room which were presented to us by him. They will remind him of his time here. We shall miss him greatly. News of the Duke's death shortly before his 100th birthday broke just after midday as it spread across our communities. Islanders reflected on a member of the royal family who never failed to leave an impression. No, I think it's terribly sad. It's the end of an era and uh, as I said, I'm a great royalist. Obviously a big part of the institution of the royal family, so yeah, yeah, and a huge loss for the Queen and her family, I'm sure, as well. Oh, quite shocked, yeah. Yeah, I thought that they, because they looked, looked as though he was um, going to make a recovery. Yeah, uh, it's very sad. Very sad indeed. Yeah, I'm really shocked. I mean, obviously he's an elderly gentleman, but uh, no, it's still a shame, isn't it, really? Much loved, I think, oh, oh, absolutely, yeah, and I think a great sense of humour, although not particularly PC sometimes. <laughs> I'm ex-military and I, I, loved, uh, I loved his military approach to everything, uh, to life in general, yeah, and I think, uh, I think he was a brilliant consort for the Queen, I have to say, absolutely superb. Right, I'm Irish, but he was a good old person. Yeah. <laughs> really was, yeah, I think he was the best of the lot, he spoke his mind. <laughs> Now let's take a look at the weather forecast with B. Tucker. We've had some sunshine today across the islands, a bit of a change on the way for the weekend and we have seen thicker clouds start to push in over the last few hours. This was taken earlier today in Jersey. That thicker cloud is giving a few showers at the moment and it will bring some more persistent rain through the weekend. So tomorrow I think is the poorest of the two days this weekend. A lot of cloud with outbreaks of rain and even when the rain does ease it will stay quite damp and drizzly. Both days I think it is going to be colder. We start to see the winds coming round from a northeasterly direction but we should see more sunshine on Sunday. Here's this weather front then. It's lying right across the islands through tonight and tomorrow, eventually pushing eastwards, but it is slow to clear, particularly the cloud. So it is going to be quite a grey day tomorrow, damp and drizzly with northeasterly winds, which will make it feel quite cold. As we head through Saturday night into Sunday, then it finally clears out of the way and we really do start to establish those northeasterly winds. So it is going to be quite cold, more in the way of sunshine on Sunday, the risk of one or two isolated showers. Now as we head through tonight we've already got that thick cloud starting to push in from the north and uh, by dawn I think we start to see the rain spreading in as well. So a cloudy end to the night, light winds, quite a bit of low cloud as well but not quite as cold as last night. Temperatures down at around 5 or 6 degrees. So cloudy and wet for most of the day tomorrow. The rain on and off, a few heavy pulses during the morning, perhaps the odd glimmer of sunshine during the afternoon and we could see one or two sharp showers but the cloud is going to be quite stubborn to clear. So quite grey during the afternoon for some of us. Northeasterly winds pick up as well and temperatures I think will struggle a bit tomorrow. Highs of just eight or nine degrees. Here are your times of high water then. We've got eight, 1859 at St Peter Port and 1854 at St Helier for tomorrow. Along our coastlines then, we've got those winds gradually coming around to a northeasterly direction. Force three to five, occasionally six, quite poor visibility with outbreaks of rain and drizzle throughout the day. So it is turning a bit cooler as we head through the weekend. Both days the risk of some rain, Saturday probably the wettest of the two days, it does turn drier as we head into next week. And that's your forecast. Thanks, B. I'll be back with our late news at 10.45 in a moment. We'll join our colleagues at Spotlight with more tributes. Goodbye for now.
One of the many charities the Duke of Edinburgh was involved with was Surf Life Saving, an integral part of coastal life here in the southwest. And the clubs say he was always ready to get involved. Well, Gemma Woodman is in Polzeth for us this evening. Gemma. Well, the Duke of Edinburgh had a special affinity with the ocean. He lent his support to many clubs and societies along the Cornish coastline. And nearly 21 years ago, he came here to Polzeth to open the Surf Life Saving Club. Harry Dower, you remember that day very well, don't you? Very well indeed. Very exciting. And you said he was like a, a good friend. He really got involved, got stuck in, good sense of humour. Once, we, once he arrived, we met him and he was very interested. He wanted to look around the new clubhouse we were building to the extent where he wanted to get up into the lookout and have a look. And we hadn't even built the steps. So he made me go and grab a ladder and put a step up so that he could get up into it. As an 80-year-old man, I think it was a... Very interesting to see him trying to do it as <laughs> very, well. Very impressive. He'd like to get stuck in. And Lee Anderson, you were just a teenager at the time. What do you remember of it? Yeah, I was. Um, I remember it being quite exciting. It was a bit like having a celebrity come down. So we're all sat waiting around to see what would happen. And he was obviously very passionate about life saving. He was the patron. What did his support do for the sport and life saving in general? Yeah, I think I think it made quite a big impact, to be honest. Um, we're a new club and getting the building, I think it was all a bit of a platform. Um, the club's gone on to kind of lots of heights with sport, uh, but also life-saving. We've got a lot of uh, members that have trained as professional lifeguards and also a lot of members who've done the Duke of Edinburgh Award um, who now give back to the community and they coach the local children in water safety skills. Leanne, um, is... Lee Anderson, thank you very much. And I know you've had 800 members then. You've now got 1,800, so it's done very well. Of course, the uh, Prince Philip, he did much. He played a major part in making the water sports accessible to young people through the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. And it's a legacy people here will continue to champion. Gemma Woodman, thank you very much. Let's take you from coast to coast, from North Cornwall to South Devon now and back to our Home Affairs correspondent Ben Wolvin in Dartmouth. And Ben, we've heard a lot about the Duke of Edinburgh's role in the military, but the Duke wasn't just known for that, was he? No, indeed. As Gemma's just been saying, he's a real champion of getting everyone outdoors, particularly young people through that award scheme, which will be perhaps one of his greatest legacies, but also just generally getting people out and about and getting people onto the water. We're standing here on the edge of the River Dart, just a short walk from the Royal Dart Yacht Club, where he was Admiral. And with us is Richard Haycock, the Commodore of that Yacht Club. Richard, how much did it mean to you to have the Duke as, as your Admiral? Admiral of the club in 1956. Uh, he took a real interest in, in what was going on on the water and in the club. Uh, and when we celebrated our 150th anniversary uh, in 2016, uh, he sent us a, a wonderful letter recalling his time at the college and also uh, telling us a lot about you know, the sailing that he did in the area. He really used to enjoy the sport. Yes, he says in that letter that he did quite a bit of sailing. That was something of an understatement, wasn't it? I think certainly, yes. I mean, uh, he started off dinghy sailing uh, and uh, became very, very competitive. Uh, and, of course, he had a lot of experience in, in Bloodhound as well, which was a beautiful 60-foot yacht and used to take people uh, all over uh, in that yacht. So a tremendous sailor, and uh, it's a very sad day for us all. How will you try to continue his spirit, his love of sailing as a club? Well, we, we've always had a tremendous interest in, in junior sailing, uh, and that's something which I think is, is so important to, to get young people out on the water, uh, learning to enjoy it, and that's something that he always highly approved of. So I think continuing in that tradition uh, would be the right thing to do. Richard Haycock, Commodore of the Royal Dart Yacht Club, thank you very much indeed for joining us to pay tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh this evening. Uh, Richard, of course, one of many people here in Dartmouth and Kingswear who hold a very special place in their hearts for Prince Philip. Victoria. Ben Wilburn, thank you very much. Well, the Duke of Edinburgh was a real champion of some of the South West's biggest events, including the Ten Tours Challenge on Dartmoor. Hundreds of thousands of young people have taken part in the event, of which the Duke was patron, and for its 50th anniversary in 2010, Prince Philip was the guest of honour. John Henderson's been speaking to some of those involved. It's the sort of physical and mental challenge that the Duke loved. 
Young teams tackling Dartmoor head on with two days of hiking over three long distances with a night under canvas. Character building, plenty of team bonding and usually a great laugh. I'm so happy I made it. Little wonder then that Prince Philip was patron and in 2010 the man himself paid a visit for the event's 50th anniversary. He came for uh, most of Sunday um, and just enjoyed going around the whole event on Sunday morning, meeting the people involved, the many volunteers that make 10 tours happen, the reservists and the regular servicemen who also um, contribute a great deal. And I'm sure for the young people involved to, uh, to come staggering off the moor after 35 or 45, 55 miles, um, to be greeted by the Duke of Edinburgh, um, shaking their hand and, and congratulating them was just uh, the very best thing that they could have wished for. What did we um, ask you? Uh, like what the weather was like, how far <laughs> we went, um, we if our uh, tent blew away. Among those he met, the person overseeing the safety of 2,400 participants. He said, uh, well, how many members of the rescue team have you got out on the board this weekend? And uh, we actually had four teams out from all across uh, Dartmoor, so we had 160. So I said, well, we, we have 160 members on the board this, this weekend. And he sort of stood back a bit of gas. He said, 160? He said, what do you do all the time? Rescue each other? And, uh, <laughs> and he was very, very down to earth, very not likeable chap. He didn't go around the 35 mile route, but, uh, but we walked him around the camp and, and onto the edge of the moor um, by, by Oakhampton camp there to see the teams coming in. Um, seemed, seemed remarkably sprightly actually, and, uh, and just so, so engaged in the event and, and interested to see what was happening and all the people involved in making it happen. He could talk the talk and walk the walk. The Duke of Edinburgh, an inspiration for all at one of the South West's toughest but most loved events. John Henderson, BBC Spotlight. The Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme has inspired many young people from the South West since it was founded by His Royal Highness in 1956. Julia Lewis from Torquay received her gold award at Buckingham Palace in 1993 and has since gone on to be a DOV coordinator herself at Churston Ferris Grammar School, meeting the Duke when her students received their awards. I just remember his incredible energy, really, particularly as he aged, um, so even into his early 90s, his energy and enthusiasm as he came in and often we were the last room of all the regions in, in the country so you think well he's, he's already done seven or eight of these in this sort of little two hour stint and um, he would he would still arrive and, and be this incredible presence in the room. I didn't sort of have a master plan at 14 when I started my bronze but it has led into a lifetime of that kind of work and volunteering for me um, and and I think that one of the reasons I'm still doing it is because I see the huge value of it. And I, I still have very fond memories of, of my time, my experiences and friendships and, um, made during that. And it's just a huge opportunity to be part of the now legacy um, that he's, he's left us to carry that on and to make sure that as many young people as possible can have those opportunities from whatever background they're from. Julia Lewis there with her memories of the Duke of Edinburgh. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Hello, B. Hello, good evening. We have had some mild weather over the last couple of days, but temperatures are set to drop as we head through this weekend. We've had some sunshine today across the southwest, more so I think for northern parts. This was taken in North Cornwall earlier today, and most places have seen a few glimmers of sunshine. Over the last few hours, the cloud has been thickening up. It's giving one or two showers, and that's a cold front that's set to clear our region through tonight, and that will allow temperatures to fall away. So it is going to be much colder this weekend. By no means, though, is it a poor weekend. It should be mainly dry with some decent spells of sunshine. I think there will be a few showers, particularly tomorrow for eastern parts of our region. So for Dorset, East Somerset, we may well see some showers. For all of us, it is going to turn colder and particularly Saturday night into Sunday, we could see a widespread frost. So we have got this weather front pushing southwards across the channel. It's largely across the Channel Islands tomorrow, but it could bring with it one or two showers for eastern parts of our region tomorrow. And it will start to spin the winds round to a northeasterly. So I think it will feel cold tomorrow, even if you do avoid any showers and with a little bit more sunshine. That low continues to move eastwards during Sunday. Again, we've got those northeasterly winds. Sunday, a chilly start with a touch of frost, but plenty of sunshine 
and one or two showers. So we've had a lot of cloud through the day. It has been quite thin in places, so we've seen some sunshine, but this cold front further north is pushing southwards over the next few hours, thickening up the cloud and bringing with it one or two showers. The showers could be heavy at times, a lot of low cloud and mist overnight tonight, and I think with that cloud cover, perhaps not quite as cold as it was last night. Temperatures for most should be frost-free, down at around 3 or 4 degrees. So it could well be a grey start to the day tomorrow, one or two showers before that cold front sinks southwards. And really, it's going to be a nice day. I think we'll see a lot of unbroken sunshine. The risk, I think, through the afternoon of one or two showers, largely for parts of Dorset, perhaps East Somerset, and they could be wintry. For most of us, it's going to be dry, bright, but it is going to feel quite cold. We start to see north to northeasterly winds and temperatures struggling uh, quite a bit lower on what we've had over the last couple of days. One or two places could make nine or ten degrees. Here we are at times of high water then. We've got 1749 at Padstow and 1810 at Plymouth. So we have got the winds swinging round to a north to northeasterly direction over the coming days. I think if you are heading to the coast, it is going to feel quite cold, particularly the north coast of Devon and Cornwall with the strength of those winds. It is going to feel colder than recent days. Sea state slight or moderate and there will be the risk of some showers, mainly through this morning. I think the shower risk will die as we head through the day. So a bit of a blip as we head through this weekend. Temperatures are set to dip. I think uh, we should be frost free tonight where we'll see a lot of cloud tomorrow. The risk of a few showers, as I mentioned, it should be chiefly for eastern parts of our region. Further west, a dry day and I think we should all see some sunshine. But it is going to feel cold with those north to northeasterly winds. Sunday, again, the small risk of a shower. I think on Sunday, if we do get a shower, it is more likely to be wintry. We could see a little bit of sleet over the higher ground. But for most of us, Sunday should be, again, dry and bright. And slightly lighter winds compared with Saturday. Then as we head into next week it's looking fairly promising. The winds switch around to a southwesterly direction so I think Monday will be a chilly start but then it will start to turn a little bit milder. Bar one or two isolated showers Monday should be mainly dry with some sunshine and that settled weather continues right through the week. It looks like a mainly dry week with plenty of sunshine and it starts to turn a little bit milder towards the end of the week and that's your forecast. B, thank you very much. On a day of tributes to His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, you can share your stories on your BBC local radio station, but we leave you this evening with memories of the Duke on some of his many visits here in the South West. Good night. <laughs>